Hey, welcome to BJJ Mental Models, episode 129. I'm Steve Kwan. BJJ Mental Models is your guide to a conceptual and intelligent jujitsu approach. And today, a guest that I've wanted to have on here for quite some time, Mr. Christian Graugart, all the way from, where are you from again, Christian? I'm originally from Copenhagen, Denmark, but I lived in St. Bart in the French Caribbean for five years. That's right. And I mean, you are on my radar for a variety of reasons. You're the head of BJJ Globetrotters, you're the creator of beltchecker.com, and you've got your new teaching BJJ website as well. So a bit of a serial artist here in terms of people who really contribute to the community. Um, I'm a big fan of all of your work. Is there anything else I'm missing that you're primarily known for that we should talk about? Good question. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm known for. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Great jokes. <laughs> well, one thing that I know you from is following you on Facebook. A while ago, you posted this video of one of the workshops that you did at one of the BJJ Globetrotter seminars. And the topic was create something. And first right. and foremost, I, I think it's so cool that when you do these seminars and these workshops, you actually turn it into kind of like a real conference where it's more than just people going on the mats and drilling a few techniques. I love the fact that you package this up almost like a business retreat in a lot of ways. It seems like there's a whole variety of things that you guys do there, and it always looks like you have an amazing time. What I was hoping to do was to dig a bit into the content of that presentation and hear your philosophy on creation, because, you know, being creative is challenging, right? You have to put your ideas in front of the world. There's always the risk of rejection, the, you know, the personal feelings of embarrassment, a whole bunch of what ifs, because things often don't go the way that you expect. And so as someone who has provided so many well-known contributions to the jiu-jitsu community. I'd love to get a quick introduction to your process and your philosophy like you talked about in that seminar. Yeah, absolutely. We started doing these workshops at the BJJ Club Trotters camps at some point. And there was an early camp maybe three years ago or something where in the US we had this, this whole theater, like this beautiful building. And I had invited, as usual, way too many instructors to teach. So they literally just like was, were teaching one hour each in the entire week. And some of them suggested they could do something like talks about like how to run a gym or something. Yeah? And I thought that was a great idea because we have the facilities for it. And I thought, hey, let's do some workshops. And I asked around, does anyone else want to talk about anything? And as we started to kind of build a schedule for that, I thought, well, if, if I ask other people to do it, I should do it myself as well. You know, that's kind of what I try to do always. I was thinking, what, what on earth can I talk about or teach that's not jujitsu? And that was really difficult because I've been just been teaching jujitsu for 20 years since I was, since I started pretty much. And I was kind of thinking, ah, oh, there's, there's not really anything I can, I can do or talk about. And then, however, there's like one thing that's, that's been haunting me pretty much forever, as long as I can remember at least, is that I've always been really, really good at kind of making things happen in a sense, like getting ideas and like pulling projects off and just getting ideas and then go from idea to reality. I've always been, been kind of good at that and always done a lot of projects, like a lot of things. But I always looked, kind of looked over my shoulder and thought like, why does everyone else not do this? You know, I, I always kind of uh, just expected any time for everyone else to start doing what I did. Like, if oh, there's no jiu-jitsu in the country, I'll, I'll start a jiu-jitsu club and figure it out. You know? I was like, okay, anytime soon, uh, 20 other people are going to do the exact same thing because it's so obvious. You know? We have no, no, no competitions. We want to compete. So I guess I'll start competitions and figure that out. And all the time I was like, yeah, this is, there's nothing special to what I do, I feel. And there's no magic or any kind of, I don't think I have like a, I wouldn't even say I have like a talent for it. It's, it's kind of straightforward. And I always thought that, well, at any, any time now, everybody else is going to kind of figure out this and just do the exact same. So I never thought it was something special. And then there was a point when, when I was sitting and kind of brainstorming about what can I talk about at this, these workshops, because I want to contribute as well. And there was a point where I thought, okay, maybe, you know, now I've spent a good 30 years just thinking, you know, since probably I was around 10, I think that was around that time when I started to just do things all the time. So a good 30 years I've spent on just waiting for everyone else to do the same as me, you know? And that was the point where I said, okay, maybe here I'm, maybe I'm doing something different. Obviously I am, but what is it? You know, I couldn't kind of, you know, figure it out what it was. So I started by making a list of all the projects I've been doing or like things I've 
created, so to say, or I don't even know what to call it, like creations in a sense, you know, it could be events or, you know, projects or businesses or things, you know. And that was probably the point where I kind of had to admit to myself that, okay, okay, Christian, you're doing something that other people are not doing, you know. And then this workshop became my my journey to look back and try to analyze uh, this enormous kind of pile of data from all these years of doing things and try to figure out, I'm obviously doing something that other people are not, what is it? And in the beginning, it was uh, absolutely like a mess. You know, I remember the very first time I talked about that, I did not really prepare anything. I just said, okay, I'm just going to sit there and try to talk about making things happen, you know? And I talked for three, more than three hours at the first workshop and nonstop. And I was like, whoa, I just opened the floodgates. I've never talked about this before. I never kind of tried to explain it to anyone, even to myself. And I was like, that was interesting. There's obviously something in there hiding that I should try to kind of put into, not into system, but, you know, just try to understand it better. And the workshop has been that process of me trying to understand uh, what do I do different than others? And also try to meet and, and talk to other people I know who are who are kind of similar in a sense, and then talk to them what they do and, and just kind of boil it down to what are the elements that makes, I don't know if it, this is the right word, but it could be a, a super creator, someone who creates a lot of things all the time. Because I guess most of us, at least I know a handful of these people like me, it's always the same people, you know, who take the initiative, who makes stuff happen. You know, it's always kind of the same people in the community. And um, what what do they do that's different? What what are the the fundamental kind of you could say habits of people who are super creators? And that's been the workshop, and I've done it probably well three years. So it's probably minus a little pandemic, probably twenty five to thirty workshops I've done like this. And and I feel like the material has kind of uh, solidified. And uh, I get a lot of feedback from doing it every time. And also, even just every time I talk about it, I take notes of stuff that I was like, oh, yeah, that makes complete sense. You know, just get it out. It's like teaching jujitsu when you when you can roll for years. But the moment you try to explain to someone what you do, then you're like, oh, I guess this is actually what I do. I had no idea. It was just like an instinct. Yeah? So so that's kind of the story of the workshop. And I feel like it's it's interesting material. I always love to, to talk about it. And I always kind of like uh, to see what people can get out of it because... It's obviously something that I'm good at. And just like jujitsu, it's interesting to share that and see if someone else can, can enjoy it. Because creating things has kind of, kind of defined my life. Uh, and I would love to share that as much as possible. Fantastic. Now, it's funny, what you're mentioning here kind of reminds me of a Pareto distribution, because I think you're right. Most of the creations within this sport seem to come from a very small group of people who are just outsized creators. A lot of the big breakthroughs, a lot of the best instructionals, they're all seem to be centralized amongst a small group of people. So this idea of super creators is something that I think really resonates. And I would love to maybe dig into that. You had alluded to how your process is different. And I do, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but it looks to me like most of the people within our community follow basically the same process, right? There is a way that people teach and there is a way that people build and run their gyms. And I think really we should be more creative in terms of how we approach those tasks. What I would like to know is when you say that your process is different, what are some of those differences? What are the things that you do or that any other super creator would do that allows someone to really have that massive impact on the community? Well, I think I think these are two things to talk about right there is that one is the common perception of how things are done. You know, like as you say, people teach in a certain way, they, they build a gym in a certain way, competitions are supposed to run in a certain way, affiliations exist in a certain way. Uh, this is in jujitsu and in everything else. And I, I always find it interesting to try and find a different kind of angle on things. And I think that's a freedom you have if you're good at creating things. And, and if you're good at looking at different angles on things, then you can come up with, with new opportunities. That's kind of an approach, I guess. And then there's, I would say, like the technical aspect of what are the steps that people do who are good at creating things. So I would say those are, those are two different things. So which, which route do you want to go down? Which rabbit hole do you pick for now? <laughs> Let's do the first one first. <laughs> That's actually not something I've been thinking about a lot. I just guess, I, I guess I just kind of like to do that. I, you know, if people complain about something, I always look for that as an opportunity. You know, I love, I love complaining and not myself, but I love to hear people complain about things because I know there must be a different way of doing it. You know, 
Because one thing I absolutely despise, which I think should be actually illegal, is to say, you know, you know, you kind of know the saying is someone should do something about this. Yeah. This, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is horrible. This is annoying. Someone should do something. Why don't someone do this differently? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, it, and I guess people feel like they take initiative to tell other people to fix it. You know, but obviously nothing is going to happen. You know. I think that a part of it too is that sometimes once you get really used to something being frustrating. It just feels like it's kind of a law of nature that you just have to deal with and you stop thinking about it. And it takes a really inquisitive mind to start noticing those things that have blended into the background, right? I mean, if you look at modern advancements that we have, you know, in, in the last decade or so, right? I I have the internet in my pocket mm -hmm. now. I can do pretty much anything I would ever want to do from a technology standpoint on my phone. Prior to having a smartphone, I wasn't walking around thinking that of all of these things that a phone should right. do, but you know, some, some of the limitations of life, we don't even think about, they just blend into the background and we can complain about them, but <laughs> they become so standard that people don't even really think a lot of the time that, oh, well, actually maybe this is an opportunity. They just accept it is as one of the annoyances of mm -hmm. life. And it, it does take a very inquisitive mind. You see this a lot in product design as well. It takes a very inquisitive mind to look at those problems and actually realize there was opportunity there. Right. I guess also people feel good about it if they complain, you know, like IBJJF is so damn expensive. Why are competition so expensive? I don't want to pay $120 about this. And then they go and sign up and compete, you know? I mean, yeah. <laughs> I guess it just makes people feel a little bit better, you know, I'm not to take up IBJJF again, but why are they such tyrants, you know? They make me go through all this stuff with forms and papers and like signatures and it's horrible. And they make me pay money for it. But I mean, then nobody, nobody but you, you know, decide to to give your money there or or do that. And I was like, why is there no good jujitsu schools where I live? You know, that was me twenty years ago. You know, so people can yeah. complain all they want. Why can I not learn jujitsu in this country? You know, someone should do something. You know? And then we learn jujitsu. Why can I not compete? It's annoying. I have to travel to compete. You know, and I think I really like. I like to look at these things where people are really annoyed about it and they complain a lot because then there is usually an opportunity to do things different. Why are affiliations built like they are? Because why do they kind of, in at least in the old days, why is there so much politics in jujitsu? I cannot go and do an open mat in another gym, you know? It is unbelievable, unbelievable to me. I mean, like the amount of politics in jujitsu. I mean, I, I'm a white collar office worker, right? I got into jujitsu in my mid twenties as a hobby. I was looking for a fun way to get exercise and I was blown away at just the amount of drama and immaturity that I encountered in this sport, right? It is, there is more high school drama in jujitsu than I encountered in high school. It's really ridiculous. And that kind of stuff is extremely detrimental to the growth of this sport. I would say that probably most of the major developments in this sport in the past few decades have come from people letting go of those old ideas and focusing on collaboration and sharing versus, you know, trying to lock everyone up and making demands of loyalty and keeping secrets from other gyms. Like that kind of stuff is just not a, I mean, imagine if scientists ran things that way, right? Like it just, it wouldn't work, right? To some extent, if you want to grow the sport, you have to share knowledge and you have to collaborate with other people. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, this is a good example of, of you, complaining about it and being annoyed about it. So there is maybe uh, an opportunity there to do things different. You know? And that's that BGJ Club Trotters kind of was born out of that, of people saying exactly what you just said. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons why I, I actually love Globetrotters is because it does seem very much like a a loose, drama-free association, right? It's It seems, and, you know, Preet has mentioned things like this before when he's been on the podcast, that it's it's jujitsu for jujitsu's sake, right? It's not about entangling people in, the, in these various networks. It's about sharing and spreading and loving the art, which I think is fantastic. Well, I think... At least for me, it has created an opportunity to experience jiu-jitsu with zero politics. I Literally, it does not exist in my world. Like what you just described, it does not exist, like whatsoever. And of course, there's many people involved, and I'm sure some of them are like will experience some of that. But but I think it's nice to have been able to create something, something where politics does not exist, and there's an opportunity for that. And uh, that was born out of, again, 
a frustration and also like other frustrations could be like, why is this hierarchy in jiu-jitsu so annoying? You know, why are, why do some black belts feel like there are black belts, black belts in jiu-jitsu, black belts in life, as they say, you know, like, <laughs> why, why, why are some so controlling and how can, why is this hierarchy putting them in a position to be so controlling? A club trust was kind of an, just in an, at an early stage, I thought, if this is going to turn into an affiliation, quote unquote, I want it to be different because I don't want to end up down the road being a professor, you know, like that. I don't want to, I don't want to put myself on, on a pedestal like that. I, I don't, but that's just me personally. You know, I, one thing that I, I really dislike is building relationships based on one person wanting something from the other person very, very much. You know? And that is, that is usually the relationship between someone who can promote you and someone who wants to be promoted. And I, I have seen enough times how unhealthy that can be, how unhealthy relationships people can, can be stuck in because they want something from the other person. And usually when they get it, that, that's usually when the relationship breaks. There's a reason why black belts <laughs> leave their, their instructors when they finally get their black belt, or at least when they get their second degree. So now they can give black belts, you know, then they don't have to pay, pay yeah. the franchise fee anymore. And all these are just other frustrations that kind of found a way to, to do things in a different way. And of course it's not for everyone, you know, some people like, like these things and that's totally as, as it should be. But at least for me, I like to, to kind of see if, if there are opportunities to, to create different kind of variations instead of saying, the, the equivalent of someone should do something about this. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Now, let's talk about pushback here for a second, because when you are doing anything that is different, there are always going to be people out of the gate who tell you, don't do that. You can't do that. That's a bad idea. Sometimes people will take deliberate glee in you failing and trying to prove you wrong, right? People seek certainty and they like the familiar. And when someone's trying to do something that's outside of that, people may try to punish you for that, right? I mean, <laughs> you of all people I know can relate to mm -hmm. this. And I think that this is a very, very bad attitude for people to have because it prevents creativity, right? If I'm afraid to do something creative because I'm worried that the community will ostracize me, I'm less likely to do that. Mm -hmm. And that shuts down innovation. And I'd love to hear from you just in terms of mindset strategy. How do you combat that? How do you combat the friction and the resistance you get when you try to go off the beaten path? I don't give a shit. <laughs> well, that's a very easy and accurate answer. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny on that topic. I actually love that answer, by the way. But one thing that I find funny, and I, I'm sure that you can probably relate to this as well. When you try to do something different, a lot of the time people will attack your qualifications, right? And that's fair. I mean, honestly, right? I mean, you you want to get data and get information from people who are qualified to provide it. So anything that you're doing for the first time, people will question your qualifications, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I, I've certainly had that experience where, you know, when we started this podcast before it grew to the scope that it has now, there were a lot of people who basically thought like, well, who the hell are you guys to be talking about mm -hmm. this stuff? But the funny thing is, as soon as you get to a certain point of traction, people just don't really ask that anymore because the fact that you did it becomes qualification enough. And, and it's really weird. Like, I mean, I'm, I'm the same guy that I, you know, I was a few years ago, really before I started this thing. But the only difference is now I have a bit of a platform. And so now people take me more seriously, even though I'm not really a different person. So I, I do find that that is one of the funny things and about getting started is you will encounter initial friction but once you have any degree of success, then suddenly a lot of that friction just disappears away because now you have a track record. So I think that it, for a lot of people, you know, it can be scary to try something new. But once you have even just the, the first step of, of success there, a lot of the haters just disappear. At least that has been my experience. Yeah, I guess I guess it's qualification is also a, a bit of an illusion, you know, because it's just if something gets established, then people forget where it started, you know? Like, honestly, not trying to talk about IBJJF all the time. It's a good example because it's jujitsu and it's kind of a big company. IBJJF is the is the governing body of our sport, right? But honestly, it's just someone who started the competition circuit and then they decided, oh, we should better check belts, you know? And then let's call it a federation. BJJ belts are real, you know? They hold real value. You know, that's, that's an established 
belief you know, that we all have to agree on. BJJ belts are real, they hold real value. And also fake promoting yourself is the worst thing you can possibly do in the world, right? It will implode Reddit if you do that. But I mean, it's not too, it's not honestly not too many years ago, this all started by just some cousins in Brazil who promoted themselves, right? Just gave themselves black belts right away. And as the moment it kind of gets established, then you forget where it came from. And this is the same in corporate world, you know, you think like, oh, Amazon is the biggest, biggest company in the world. But if you read the story, the book on Amazon, it's literally 20 years train wreck of just like bad decisions and throwing money into a, and like an enormous hole, you know? And I think this is, as you say, you just got to keep doing it. And then eventually it's like, oh, I, people kind of have, have this perception that's, oh, this is established. This is how things are. And then they forget that, oh, you, maybe, I don't know how many podcast episodes you did, but it's quite many. Eh? And you're like a professional podcaster. Yeah? And then at some point they're like, they, they don't see that, oh, actually, you, I don't know, you guess, I guess you just started in your, in your bedroom with a tiny microphone at some point, you know, and then. It ended up with with that, and I think that happens with everything. So you just gotta kind of just fuck it, just go for it, and then at some point it might may or may not be the established kind of standard of what people believe is is the real deal. You know? Yeah, I love you know it's funny when you were talking about the danger of fake black belts. I immediately thought, well, hold on, the Gracies promoted themselves, and then you brought that up as well, right? I mean, it it takes a lot of confidence to do that and to basically say. I am doing something that is different and I am claiming my stake of the land here. Come at me, right? That's a hard thing to do, but you know that most successful people did that at some point and they endured the ridicule and then they succeeded. You know what's one thing that I find kind of funny about this is that, you know, if you know adults, you meet people as adults, you know, you have kind of a perception of who they are, what they can do. You know, you, you, you see them as a certain personality, but then you meet people that you went to school with since since you were kids. And you can totally see the child in them, right? You cannot unsee the child in these people. You, you cannot, you can see their their insecurities and everything they had as kids, how that is still in them as, as an adult. And if I see my old friends from school, I will just see the kids. You know, I will see they were annoying kids or they were like, you know, really well behaved or something. You can kind of see where they came from. But if you meet people as adults, you you don't have that perception, right? And I think that is that is really that's interesting because that's that's kind of you see where it started, you know, and it's the same with, with corporate or as you say, like established beliefs or something. If you don't see where it started, then you just take it for at face value in a sense, you know? This is a tremendous bias problem that you encounter in the corporate world where people who hire someone, if you stay at a company long enough, they will always see you as the person that you were when you right. started. You could work there for 20 years and you may still struggle to get promoted because people will remember when you were like the junior administrator, you know, you were like the, the lowest person on the ladder and they'll never be able to quite break that mindset. And they'll be like, well, we can't promote this guy to executive because, you know, he's just doesn't have the experience, but really the person does. It's just that you have this mental anchor of people from the first time they met you. That's actually one of the reasons why, really honestly, I mean, I hate to say it, but in the professional world, if you want to actually get promoted and make more money, really what you have to do is you have to quit your job and find new jobs because it will just be easier at a new place where they don't have that history of looking at you as a junior person. That's one of the unfortunate things about human beings, right? We have this bias. We anchor people to our memories of what they were. And yeah, that that can very much be a problem when you're, you know, you're looking to try something new because people will always remember you as, as the little kid, right? I mean, you, you hear jujitsu people talk about this, right? They'll, the older guys will go to some black belt who's, you know, just won a world championship and they'll say, oh, I remember when you were just a little kid. Right. <laughs> like it's, we always anchor people back to their original memory, which is one of, one of the interesting things about, about people for sure. That's really funny. Yeah. I, I, I know I have no experience with the corporate world, but that, I learned something new there. That's really interesting. That makes complete sense. Yeah. Well, I have had my problems with this too. I have caught myself doing this where, you know, maybe I'm I'm looking to hire someone and they're applying for a really senior job and someone that I haven't talked to in like 15 years reaches out of the blue 
and they apply for the job. And I think to myself, well, I know this person. They're a good candidate, but they're just too junior. And then I realize, shit, it's been 15 years since I talked to this person. The last memory of this person I have, they were a kid. But now they've been they've got like 15, 20 years of experience. They're probably a legitimate person for this job now. And I realized I really I need to check my biases in situations like this because you you create this image in your head of what people are and what they can or can't do. And I think that's one of the things that actually prevents people from striking out on their own and trying to be creative, right? Is if you are, if you're surrounded by people who just don't believe you can do it and they, they look at you as like a little kid or as someone who just doesn't have the skill set, you'll never get there, right? You have to, at some point, be willing to do the thing that you're not qualified to do and put yourself out there if you want to change the world. Yeah, for sure. I mean, to be good at something, you have to be bad at it first. There's like literally no way around that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I have a question for you. On the topic of of rolling things out, like one of the things that I find fascinating about really any big initiative, especially a business, is getting the getting traction, right? It's easy to start putting stuff together, but it's really hard to get like one person on board and then 10 people on board. And once you get to a certain point, you know, the machine is moving and it becomes easier, but getting like that first few group of people behind you, building the small first members of your tribe is sometimes often the hardest part. What are what is your advice for doing that? Like when you're kicking something off brand new, I mean, a good example, I guess, would be teaching BJJ, right? Which you're just you just launched. When you're starting something brand new, there's there's nothing there, like nothing at all. You got to build this thing up from scratch. All you have is the idea. What do you do to get the ball rolling so that people will get behind it? That's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I actually don't feel like I'm trying to build businesses ever you know never i never i never built a business i don't feel like i ever built a business and i never have the approach that oh this this should succeed or like i really want this to you know people to love this or if it works it works to be honest i just kind of spam the world with creations in a sense <laughs> and i i fail at many of them and some of them are just, just like blow up to amazing things and many of them just turn into absolutely nothing but honestly i don't do anything and i never have like a business approach to any of these things i never do like you know belt checker was like um a uh, belt checker came out of frustration of two two major frustrations from people and from myself belt verification in jiu-jitsu is absolutely ridiculous and it's so annoying how it works, built, built on hierarchy, built on people wanting something from other people. And Facebook is horribly annoying and addicting and full of advertisement and annoying things. So that, those were some frustrations that we thought, then I thought, oh, maybe there's another way of doing this, you know? So that became belt checker, but I don't have, my approach to belt checker is not, we need more and more people to sign up. I need this to be a success. I need this to push this and kind of turn this into something big. I just kind of you know, I create little Tamaguchis, you know, and then I feed them and see what happens, you know, and I guess, I don't know, I just kind of spam, sp spam creations, and then some of them work and some of them don't, but I never have like, I never feel like I want to start a business, you know, never, and, and the same with Globetrotters or anything I ever did at the gym, it was never with the purpose of starting a business. I just do, you know, what I think would be fun, and if I do enough of it, then, you know, some, some, if I, some of them will just maybe not fail. Have you ever read the book, The Lean Startup by Eric Ries? No. It's a, it's a fascinating book. He talks about basically how to build these kinds of like business machines and get them off the ground. And what he says is very similar because he's talking about startup businesses. And what he's saying is actually very similar to what you're saying, which is that there really is no magic formula. You have no idea what's going to work until you try it. So the secret is to build a process where you just try a lot of things really, really fast and let them fail or let them succeed, right? And just measure really quickly which one of these things is working, like which which of the Tamagotchis is yeah, growing, exactly. <laughs> as you said, right? And then just kill off the ones that go nowhere. I mean, what the thing is, when people like me from the outside look in, they see this guy who made these like three or four major contributions to the community. So it looks like, you know, Graugart's got the Midas touch. <laughs> Everything he touches is a big success. But clearly what I'm probably not seeing is that for every one of those things, there were 50 little side projects that just died on the vine because no one cared. There's a good quote, uh, keep failing until you accidentally don't fail anymore. <laughs> That's literally what I do. <laughs> like the stuff that you see is like my Amazons that just accidentally did not fail, you know? And all the shit behind it were just like random shots in the dark, you know? 
Apple was an absolute like train wreck for <laughs> for a long time. They made some shitty stuff, yeah. Yeah, like a lot of I mean Apple's interesting because to some extent they're they're still sort of true to the initial vision, but I mean they've pivoted and changed like crazy over the years. I mean a lot of businesses do this. They by the time they actually find traction, they barely resemble, you know, maybe there maybe there's a philosophy that's the mm-hmm. same, but other than that, the actual guts of the business have consistently changed since the the original, you know, bricks were laid. And a lot of that is just, you know, like having a pipeline, like continuously be trying any things. It's like, you know, it's like a salesperson, right? A salesperson isn't going to close every one of their deals. They know they're only going to close like one in a hundred. So the trick is you're shot every time you can, right? right? You shoot a lot of times because eventually one of them is going to hit. And once one of them hits, then you double down on that and you grow that and you, you build that traction. So that's, that's really interesting. I think also that, that kind of what's super important is to, you know, every failure will still get accomplished something in a sense. I, at that workshop, I have one of the slides is, is called Christian's failed projects with a long list of, of, of projects that just did not work. But then when, when I, when I kind of talk about that list and I have some friends there in the, in the audience, who has known me for many years, they kind of, they look at it weirdly. It's like, that was absolutely not a failure. How can you say that's a failure? You know, many of these things that they, they knew the project, but it's, it's all about how you perceive it because what is a failure? You know, let's, I can just pick one from the list. Um, I, I ran a CrossFit gym for, I don't even know, seven years or something. I never did a single CrossFit class myself, not one workout. I just used it for rehab, <laughs> but it lost money every single month for seven years. You know, it costs us money every single month for seven years. So you can say that's a failure from if you have a business approach to things. But what else came out of it? You know, I I had that one place had like 15 or 20 employees that worked, you know, like young people. It was their income, you know, that supplemented their studies. That was their actual job to work there and teach it. And, And socially, it was an absolutely amazing vehicle just for meeting people and, you know, people who brought a lot of value to to my life and and we did a lot of fun things we had a lot of competitions we got in great shape obviously you know we used it a lot for the jiu-jitsu and mma competition team we used that for for physical training like the list of things that were positive that that valuable that came out of it is so incredibly long but if you look at the at just the the balance sheet it was a, a failure you know so what is a failure after all i mean that's that's the thing you know every creation comes comes out of an enormous chaotic mix of of these things and and failures are one of them so so i would say that the more projects i can fail at the 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 more stuff happens that make me that allow me to do something else you know it might just be be meeting the right people or combining some ideas or like making some friends or you know having a conversation or you know probably something i randomly did just because i had that crossfit gym uh, and i met some people there made me do something else you know mm mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's that's fascinating, and I, again, I I got to call back to that book. I mean, in this book, the Lean Startup, I highly recommend it. Anyone listening to this gives it a read if they haven't already. But one of the things they say is that like the purpose of a startup, and in this case, I would consider a lot of your initiatives to basically be similar, mm-hmm. right? That you're you're trying to get something new off the ground. The purpose of of a startup is not to build a product or to make money. It's to acquire knowledge, right? It's to keep going through this loop of trying things and fi- doing little experiments and figuring out, okay, did this work? Did this not work? And whether you make money or not, or whether you succeed or not in the first try is not really that important. What matters is that you learn. If you try something and it fails disastrously, that's still a win because you've learned something that doesn't actually work, right? And so now you can go through the loop again and you can try again with a more refined skill set and more refined knowledge. And if you do that 10 or 20 times, by the time you, you've you learned all of those lessons, you will eventually get to the point where you're making the money and you're selling the product and you're building the team and you're growing the network or whatever your goal may be. So I, I think that that's a really interesting point that you bring up. I mean, I, I remember when we started this little initiative that we've got here back in the early days, like this thing 
wasn't even a jujitsu podcast, actually, when we started it. It was a completely different idea that was actually so bad that I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> but but over time, you know, we... No, now we have to hear it. Oh, God. It was, it was basically like a philosophical variety show that I did with my brother. And the first few episodes were just a train wreck. And we realized, like, okay, there is no cohesive glue or vision to what we're doing, but we're, we're both black belts. And so at some point we thought, well, fuck it, let's start talking about jujitsu. And just by accident, we hit on this weird confluence where he was, uh, my brother trains under Rob Bernacki from Island Top Team, and I train under Don Whitefield from Port Coquitlam, where I live. And we, have, so we have very different styles in terms of how we learn. But the one thing that we learned is that we both use systems thinking for jujitsu, which is still a very emerging, developing thing. So we kind of started pulling these concepts from like the business world, from, you know, from academic studies and trying to figure out how to apply them into jujitsu so that you could get rapid knowledge gains when you're training on the mats. And it just, it was like a nerve that got hit. We launched the first episode. I mean, normally when you launch a podcast, usually it's a disaster out of the gate. Like you're lucky if one person downloads it. I mean, you could you could tell your mom to go download the episode and you'll still get zero views, right? Like it's, it's real bad when you try to launch one of these, but pretty clearly just by trying, we were in the right place at the right time with the right idea. And almost right out of the gate, we got like a hundred or a thousand listeners. And then it just kind of grew up and up and up and up from there. So it, it wasn't so much about just like hustling like crazy. It's just by virtue of of pivoting and going through this, this process, we eventually wound up in the right place at the right time. And we were able to come up with something that I, I hope is good. Uh, <laughs> we, so that, that's kind of the story of how this thing came to be. Yeah, I mean, as as I as I talk a little bit about in that workshop, is that every idea you're gonna get is usually shit. Like, just gotta accept yeah. that, you know. And still, now I get the worst ideas ever, every single day. And it's part of the process, you know. You you gotta do a lot of bad things. <laughs> yeah, we were talking to Lachlan Giles, and he said the same thing. He said like he said ninety nine percent of my ideas are terrible, and I thought like it's hard to believe that almost right as, as a mere mortal like myself it's hard to believe when these people come in and they say all my ideas are bad it's really hard to look at that and be like okay is this true or is this guy just trying to be like fake humble but no no it's like having talked yeah, having talked to enough elite people now in all walks of life, I know that he's telling the truth, right? Yep. <laughs> it's, he's he's He might be bad 99% of the time, but the process of testing allows him to find that 1% of the time where he's really successful. And that's how you build something right. new. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's true. And it's the combination of, of ideas and skills and time and people that over time will kind of turn into something, but you need a lot of bad ideas in the system, you know? So that's, that's, that's actually important. It's an important process to come up with really, really bad things. You know? I do that all the time. <laughs> well, I do have to thank you for belt checker. I, I love belt checker probably for a reason that you didn't intend. Although you tell me my, my black belt lineage is technically under Ricardo de la Hiva. And I mean, I women's rights is an issue that I take extremely seriously. And after the accusations against him, you know, a few years ago or however long it was ago, I kind of came to this point where I wasn't really comfortable having this guy's name written on my certificate, right? And I don't want to promote that guy. And that raises bigger questions too of like, what is lineage anyway? Do I really want to be the property of this other person that like, you know, it just, it, it is kind of weird in that sense. And the thing that I love about Belt Checker is that it gives me the recognition of my peers, which to me is way, way more valuable than some piece of paper that was signed by, you know, some mothership in Brazil, right? It means a lot more to me that there is a profile page you can go to with my name and photo on it and a whole bunch of people in the community who vouch for my contributions. That means a lot to me. I mean, if people want to know my lineage, I say that I'm like a black belt under belt checker. I carry around my ID card in my wallet. I don't have my original certificate anymore. I got rid of it. So, I mean, beltchecker.com is my professor, I guess, in the grand scheme of things right now. And that's one of the cool things I love about it, right, is it there is something very heartwarming about having lineage from the community versus, you know, being tied down to, to one person and then having that ball and chain attached. Well, you can say that lineage is the original belt checker, mm -hmm. right? That, that was what people used to kind of validate their belt or whatever you say. I, 
I am good because I learned from this guy who learned from this guy who learned from this guy who learned from this guy. <laughs> yeah. you know, it's kind of weird. It's kind of like the, the most low tech version you could possibly come up with for, of, of Belt Checker, yeah. And Belt Checker is like the, yeah. as, that's like the SpaceX rocket that, that like, like lands again, you know. That's, that's literally what it is. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's like two extremes of, of the technology right there. Yeah, I think lineage can be helpful in in a world where there's no technology to make this process more optimized. I can see the value of lineage because if you know that one instructor has really high standards and they give someone a black belt, okay, sure. I mean, that can be relied on. But once you get to the point where you're tracing through five degrees of lineage, you know, it's it becomes so hard to track and, you know, things evolve and change so much that you can't say that, you know, just because someone was promoted by someone who was promoted by someone who was promoted by someone who was promoted by Helio Gracie like that at this point it it kind of loses its meaning and what I have found and I didn't expect was that I now much prefer the validation from my peers versus the validation from some old school lineal system yeah and you know there are other things involved that like lineage is just the place where you randomly signed up to train you like and that's one thing you know so it's like, I'm really proud of this, but that's just literally the place where you just walked through the door the first day, you know, because you had no idea what it was just a literally it's the, your lineage is the, is the place that has had the best search engine optimization probably. You know? yeah, I was just going to say that that's actually when, when I started jujitsu, literally I went to Google and I typed in Brazilian jujitsu and I went to the first result because I thought, well, this place must be good if they're the top hit. And after, you know, about two years of training there, I kind of realized i think this place might be a cult <laughs> so i started being a little bit more choosy in terms of where i go yeah. <laughs> but yeah it's like a, how how much of lineage in the year 2021 is actually all about search engine optimization yeah, a lot i would say it's I, I think if you want to be proud of it you should be proud of your professor's seo skills you know that's what you're that's what you're really proud of <laughs> and and you know, there's another thing too it's kind of weird if people say let's let's just imagine someone says i am their lineage which i it's kind of cringe even to to think about it. That's cool, you know. I guess I'm a decent instructor. I spent many years on teaching jiu-jitsu. But, you know, there are also some people who are just useless as learning jiu-jitsu. You know, they can spend 10 yes. years, they still cannot win a single match in a competition at Blue Belt, you know. So what is the lineage there, you know? Christian is a great instructor. Oh, he's your lineage, but you suck. You no, know, it has nothing to do yeah. with me, to be honest, you know. And then I have some guys who I've been teaching, but honestly, they're just like super talented. They like... They do a lot of research themselves and a lot of experimenting and, and they're kind of intelligent and physically, you know, and they become like really good black belts. So it's like, yeah, Christian's, that's Christian's lineage. He produces amazing black belts. But honestly, it has, it had yeah. nothing to do with me. I just kind of give them a little push in the right direction and they figure everything out themselves and they're usually better than me at many things, you know? So, so those are two extremes of having students and, and none of them you can say is because they were my lineage, you know, like their, their actual result in their skills. You know? So, well, on that note, I mean, we talked about the idea of a super creator on the topic of being a teacher. Can you teach someone to be a super creator? Have you had the experience where people go to that create something talk and they come out of it and then like six months later, they've got a hundred, like a hundred things going on that are just awesome. And some of them are taking off. Like, have you had any experience where people have been able to develop that skill set? Is that something that is teachable? I think so. I would say there are many, 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 many projects coming out of uh, from people who did that workshop. I would not take any credit for it. But I would say to actually, I, I will use this term loosely because I don't think it's that cool to kind of be a super creator. I think it takes time, a lot of time. You know? That's one of the elements that, and I also do this full time and I've been doing it for as long as I can remember, like literally uh, probably 30 years uh, doing nothing else. And this is, it is literally my job at this point to just kind of come up with things and create them and see what, see what happens. So obviously I'm a bit ahead of the field. And having done this workshop a few times, I don't think in that time it's possible to take anyone from zero to kind of, you know, my intensity of, of this stuff. But but yeah, on a smaller scale, uh, most absolutely. And who knows where, where that will take people in five, 10 years if, if, they, if they really kind of try to go down that route of creating a lot of things. Um, 
on a small scale, so hundreds or thousands of projects that are really interesting. A lot of them absolute shit, completely failures, but then uh, something else comes out of it, you know? And that's important. You got to do shit projects, a lot of them. Do you think it's possible to achieve that level of contribution and to be a super creator if you are not devoting your full time to it? What if you're working 40 hours a week, you've got kids, maybe you can afford to spend five to 10 hours a week on side projects. Is that enough time or is this a lifestyle that has to be pursued full time? I don't know. I have no data to to kind of base that answer on. I think it also depends on what do you mean by super, you know? How much do you want to create? <laughs> I mean, can you in your free time like set up let's say a large party or a big event or take your friends traveling for a competition? Could you do like a social event, invite people over? Can you do that with a few hours a day of, of, of free time to plan that? Absolutely. Yeah. Could you set up like a, a full day of something happening, inviting some people to something happening that's fun, invite, invite someone to provide some, some value to others? Absolutely, you can set that up in, with, a, with just a few hours a day of, of commitment. Yeah, 100%. I would say that because I honestly don't work that much, to be fair. <laughs> My experience has been that it's definitely mm -hmm. possible to get the ball rolling with time boxed amount of effort. A lot of the successful initiatives that I am familiar with, both within the world of jujitsu and outside of it, started off as side jobs or hobbies and then just grew and grew. Here in Vancouver, a lot of the gyms that are now very successful, I remember when they started out and they were someone else's part-time thing. You know, maybe they didn't like quit their job and then go and start a jujitsu gym right away. They just leased out some mat space from an existing gym that was teaching Taekwondo. And they just ran a class one time a week, right? Very low overhead to do something like that. They'd start getting students. And eventually it gets to the point where the reputation builds and the student base is big enough that they think, okay, I got to actually, if I care about this and I want to see it grow, I might have to quit my job. And then next thing you know, they're a full-time jujitsu instructor, right? And the same thing can happen a lot in, in business. A lot of really successful enterprises start out because someone was trying to make a bit of money on the side. So my stance is it absolutely is possible to get traction with limited time. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think this is a standard story you know, for anyone I know who made something that turned into, I don't know, a big thing. It could be a job, but it could also not be a business. Always started on the side. And I, I actually have a few, few kind of illustrations about this in, in my workshop about jumping ships. It's never that you do something, stop it, and then the next day you come up with a new idea, you start that and that grows into something. It's always that you're on one ship and parallel to that, you start building another ship, like slowly, you know, a small boat, like a little rowing boat. And then one day it's big enough so you can jump to the other ship. But it's, but it's, they always overlap. I've seen that with every single person I know who, when I had uh, an office job, every single person who left to do their own thing was, it's something they've been sitting and kind of hacking away at, you know, in the lunch break or something, you know, <laughs> after mm -hmm. works. And then suddenly it was big enough that they, they, they jumped ship. And uh, that's what I've been doing always. You know, and, when I went to school, a friend had a software company and I asked him, hey, can I work for free because I, I, I want to learn about programming? Can I come by like a few days after school and just sit and kind of learn stuff and work for you? I can design like icons and stuff. I know a little Photoshop. They're like, yeah, yeah sure. Well, we pay for icons. Why don't you come in and try to draw some for us? And uh, so I worked for free like two days a week after school, just a few hours. And I did that for a few years while I was in school. And then when school ended, obviously they were like, well, we have to hire you because you know everything uh, that we do. So I jumped that ship from school to, to work. And I, that was kind of equivalent of high school. So I kind of just said, no, that's great. I don't want to go to school. That was, that was a good job offer. And then while I was doing that office job on the side, I was starting the martial arts gym and it just started like literally five people like headlocking each other, watching VHS tapes of uh, Dan Henderson and uh, Chris Howder. And uh, that was literally it. And then suddenly we were 12, 20, 30, you know, suddenly more people came in and we rented some hours in a judo place. And um, yeah, that, that kind of grew on the side. And suddenly it's like, okay, I guess I can quit my job now. So I jumped ship to that and I did that for many years. And then parallel to that, Globetrotters kind of started happening like randomly. And at some point I was like, oh, I guess I can quit the gym and just start doing club charters instead. And 
and that's that's been the story for me and for everyone else I know that that kind of shifted their direction in a sense. And I think this is extremely common. And I think this is something you can purposely kind of look for or kind of aim for, you know. So yes, absolutely. Do, do you start something that you like on the side for a few hours a week? And then, you know, if other people also like it, if you can solve a problem for yourself and other people happen to have the same problem, then who knows? Maybe they also want to be involved in it. Let me ask a final question. When it comes to people who succeed at creation versus everyone else, is it really as simple as like the only difference is the first group of people, the creators, they try and they try over and over again. Is that really the only difference between super creators and everyone else? No, I don't think so. Not from my experience. I think I think there's more to it. But if you say it's the final question, then either we're going to stop it there, I'm going <laughs> to answer this question for an hour. <laughs> <laughs> well, answer the question for an hour. No, uh, or people can watch that workshop. I think it's like two two hours or something, two hours. The it's YouTube. long, man. I, I took a look at that and I thought, oh boy, I better get a drink ready. This is a long YouTube It video. is long. And remember the first one was like three and a half hours. I've once done it in one hour, but I was like, it was in one breath, you know, and I talked as fast as I could just to see, but I, it's it's very much like build around stories. And there's always some stories that I don't want to leave out. You know, I think they kind of create the glue of that workshop, but failures is absolutely crucial. It's, it's like one of the five, five elements that I feel always goes into the routine of me and, and other people who are good at this stuff. And failures is just one of them. And they're all kind of equal. And failures, you can say, just they just keep trying, you know, keep trying, fail, 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 and one of them works. But and there are others, so I don't know. Do you have t- well, what are the others? Do you have your drink ready, or what was that? <laughs> Go for it. I want to know. I'll try to do it briefly. <laughs> this is where you insert the link to the workshop if people want to dive into this. Yeah. This wrap it up. Uh, by the way, there will be yeah, there will be a link to that in the show notes. So if you wanna if you wanna see this mythical workshop, it will be linked in the show notes to this episode. <laughs> right. Always at least one person saying you should do this as a TED talk. You realize TED talks are like fifteen minutes, right? I cannot do this. I cannot do this <laughs> under two hours. Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Failures is one of them. There are five. You know, failures, brains, skills, ideas, and karma. And those are the five things. And those are kind of the five. Ah, I'm still looking for the right words. I've been doing this for three years. Those are the kind of the five elements that I keep feeding. You know, I I just feed these five little little things, and every day as much as I can, and and that over time that kind of turns into something. And that is literally, especially after doing this workshop and kind of understanding this, I, I have also used it as an experiment to to kind of test it in a sense that I say, oh, I guess this, it looks like this is what I'm doing. I should try to do that more. I should just like super like turn that up to 11 and just do this more and more and more. And, and I would say my, my volume of creations have just exponentially grown uh, since I've been trying to do this. So in a sense, it's like I try out my own drugs, you know, in a sense. That I that I did designed, and yeah, it's really interesting. I think it's been interesting to find it. And over the course of the last three years of talking about this and and kind of talking to other people who do to do something similar, at least I have never kind of added anything or removed anything from that 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 kind of list of five things. And 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 the idea is that that kind of light bulb moments do not exist. You know, like people who are not good at creating things, they imagine that you just kind of sit around. Nothing happens, and then bada, just out of the blue, like the perfect idea comes up, and and that's your new job. <laughs> Congratulations, your life is changing right now. You know, it does not exist. Uh, how creations come to life is always kind of a wild, wild, wild combination of of these five elements uh, over time. And I find that if I just spam these five things in my life, then a lot of things happen. You know, and some of them work out, and you're like, oh, that was an. Um, Christian does amazing projects and this I see these six things that he did and they all took off. It's fantastic. And then behind that is like eight thousand bad ideas, <laughs> like a hundred other projects that just like ran into a wall on day one, you know? Yeah, so that's it. Ideas, karma, failures, brains, and skills. That's th- those are the things that I, I kind of try to to feed all the time. Well, would you say that any of these five things are untrainable or 
are any of these five things fixed? Is it the case that there's something here where just you have either got it or you don't? Or is it the case that all of these things can be developed? Because, I mean, brains, for example, what do you mean by that? I mean, are you talking about some natural intelligence you have? Or, you, or are you talking about the knowledge that you accrue over time? No, it's, like, it's literally just straightforward straightforward things to do. It's like it's nothing like magical. There's just no luck involved whatsoever. It's literally just do things. Brains is uh, just connect with other brains, which means you have conversations and you read books. And you listen to podcasts. Boom, that's it. Everyone can do that, right? So you don't necessarily, when you say brains, you don't necessarily mean someone has to be, you know, a genius. You just mean that they have to connect minds. Very often, if, if you keep something, like imagine if you have a lifetime, if you want to create things, you have a lifetime and you're alone. You sit in a room, you never talk to anyone. Like that's like one brain over 70 years, right? But imagine if you could kind of multiply that, like 10,000 brains in 70 years. You know? uh, how, how much could you create out of that? And very often, if you have an idea, let's say you have 10 bad ideas. Tomorrow you take your notebook and then, or even tonight or today, whatever you're listening to this, you write down just 10 stupid ideas today, right? I promise you, I 100% guarantee you, if you take that list, you walk up to another person and you say, hey, let me tell you about these 10 ideas. Immediately, that connection between your brains will feed off other ideas right away. If you sit and have a conversation for 10 minutes, it happens always. If I read a book, you know, it's usually like autobiographies or something. Every single time I read a book, like there is absolutely no exceptions, then I will come up with something, you know, that will generate something in my head, some skills, some ideas, something that I write down. So brains is literally just connect with other brains. And it could also be, I would say, listening to podcasts, but it also very much depends on the podcast. I, I Sometimes I get something out of it, and some of them, they're just like for falling asleep, you know, not yours, of course, yours is amazing. But <laughs> <laughs> I never I, I never fall asleep to your podcast. Okay. Well, let me let me dig into brains just a little bit more, because something I'd, I'd like to point out, you know, one of the one of the initial icky feelings that people get when you talk about sharing ideas, there's always going to be people who say, well, I don't want to share my ideas because I don't want Bob or whoever to steal my idea, right? This is, there. people are paranoid sometimes about this stuff. And by, by being paranoid and by refusing to talk about their ideas, they deny themselves the ability to actually grow that idea and to connect with other people who might help them build that idea. So I, I found that's kind of a scarcity mindset that some people have where they just, they're afraid that like, if I put this out there, someone else is going to steal it. But in most cases, an idea by itself is not worth much, right? It's, it's more about your ability to execute that idea. Yeah. I mean, there's a few things to consider. First of all, all your ideas are shit. That's very important. All ideas are bad. For it to turn into something amazing, it has to be combined with skills, karma, brains, and failures over time. Uh, otherwise, it's just not worth anything in my in my mind. So the idea alone is just like useless. You know, if I I could come to you with the idea of belt checker, I'd just talk about that with a random person. It's not like they just can just pull that off right away, right? If they could, then that would have happened a long time ago. You know, and also remember that Bob is one of those 99.9% .9 who will just say, someone should do something about it. You know, they, nobody actually does it. You know, they, they, they just love to complain about it. Oh, someone should make this amazing competition. And it's like crickets for 10 years. You know, nobody does it, you know, until it's usually those like same five people who always make things happen. So yeah, so sharing them are super important. I will, if I get amazing ideas, immediately I will talk to someone about it. Like I will tell it, tell it to everyone and uh, see what they have to say and see what else, what's the next step that can kind of be taken to, you know? And and what, who cares if they do the same thing? I don't, like, what do I care? It's got nothing to do with me. It's not like you're going to do something that nobody ever did. Right, right. Now, for the third item for skills is that just self-explanatory, literally just the process of learning and developing skills that allow you to achieve things that other people are not able to achieve? Is it is it literally that simple or is there something more to it? The idea is that, you know, the how society works today is that we build societies of experts, you know? like we become super experts. And uh, most people will want to go to school to become a super expert in one thing that they can 
that everyone else in society, because we live close to each other, they will pay you for that one one skill. And you have to outsource everything else you need done to someone else in society who are experts in that. You know? and like the common thing is like people go to university, I don't know, study something. I don't, I don't know how that works. I didn't go to school. <laughs> study one thing and they are so good at it that someone needs to hire you and pay you money every month for that skill. But if you if you need to fix your plumbing, then you need to pay someone else to do it. You know, that's kind of a society of specialists. And there's another kind of philosophy of the the Renaissance person, where it's kind of I guess in I guess it's loosely based on like Leonardo da Vinci and stuff like that. Like in the, in the Renaissance, the um, kind of the the pinnacle of being a man was that you had like four very separate skills. It's probably like write poetry, you know, sword fighting, host a soiree or something, you know, like <laughs> some complete, like complete <laughs> random skills. But if if you're really good at, at like those distinct things, you know, then, then you were a real man, you know? So the Renaissance person, we should call it today, is, is someone who is not a super expert in one thing, but is, is an expert in many things, you know? And by definition, an expert is very easy. You just got to be better than 99.9% of the world's population, then you're an expert. And to gain that is super easy. You stop scrolling Instagram for like a few days and then you just read like the first five books on a subject and bada bang, you're better than absolutely almost everyone, right? Like jujitsu, you know, you train for six months, you you still suck, but you can probably beat most people who walk through the door at your size. You know? That's really the point. You're not trying to become the best in the world because that's impossible, but you're trying to become an expert. And if you're an expert in many, many things, then that's where the magic happens. And and I read about this for like many years ago, I think maybe 10 years ago. I was like, God damn, this is what I've been always doing. You know, I literally got that job out of school at the software company because I was like an okay programmer. I kind of could read the code and I was like an okay graphical designer. But if I tried to get a job as either one of those, th- those things, it was impossible. You know, I, I was just not good enough. But the combination of those two things, I could kind of, nobody else could do that. You know, I could read the code, but also build the interface because I knew how, like, how to do the graphical side of it, the design side and, and the coding side. So the combination of skills there kind of put me ahead of the field. And that's, that's the important point is that to become the world's leader, that is like literally impossible in one skill. You know, like who is the number one person in the world in one skill? Impossible. If you, want, you want to be the best jujitsu guy in the world? What does that take? Impossible. Like you cannot do it. You have to beat everyone. Even if you're top 16, you get invited to the ACDC. <laughs> ACDC, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that tournament sounds awesome. <laughs> hey, hey you, have you ever looked up? You got a, a side note for all the listeners. Look up. <laughs> it, this must be 20 years ago. A radio show, some... <laughs> Some radio host ask a guy in a quiz to spell ACDC. It's <laughs> just amazing. He can't do it. Anyway, ADCC. You get invited to ADCC as the top 16 in the world. And you, like, if you're not top three, you have zero chance of winning. You know, Would you become the best basketball player in the world? What would that take? No, imagine. That's impossible. The thing is, the world leader in one skill can do pretty much whatever they want. You know, that, that then you just like... If you're the best jiu-jitsu competitor in the world, it doesn't matter if you're a complete idiot or whatever. If you're the best jiu-jitsu competitor in the world, you film like an instructional video. You don't even have to be a good teacher or know about teaching. People will buy that shit like right away, you know, and you will become a millionaire just selling DVDs online, you know. And, and this goes for any skill. If you're the world's leader, then you can always make things happen very, very easily. You know? But to become the world leader is literally impossible in one skill. Would you want to be the, the world's best investor? Like, what would that take? It's like literally impossible. You, know, you cannot do it in any skill. But the key here is that if you're an expert in many things, and I realized at some point I'm an expert in many, many damn things. I'm not really good at one thing. And it's very kind of saying I... I decided I don't want to study anything in university or something, but I just want to learn a lot of things and be kind of okay at everything. If someone, if I just kind of randomly, like someone mentions something, I say, okay, I can take pictures. You know, I know how to do that. Some of my friends are getting married next month and they're like, okay, I, I randomly am an expert. I'm an expert DJ, which means I absolutely suck but I'm like a white belt, like four stripes, but I can do it. You know, I can pull it. I'm better than everyone else yeah. at the wedding. So they're like, why don't you come into fucking Kansas and teach at a wedding next month? I'm going I'm doing that. The tickets are booked and everything. Anyway, so I'm kind of good at everything, you know, uh, like many, many, maybe like 30, 40 things, but I'm not equivalent of like 
someone who studied one of those things for 10 years at university. But the combination of these things is the key because if you combine skills and usually just complete random skills, then you can come up with another, uh, like a new skill. There's no one else there, you know, and that will put your head of the field. So in the microcosmos of, let's say, a Christian is 17 years old, he finishes high school. Randomly, I am the only one they can find who can both read and write like basic code and also know about graphical design. So like they had to give me the job and there was no one like in the market to hire for that job. Uh, so I got the job right out of school. And um, and that's an example where I was ahead of the field just because I combined skills. And this is such an interesting thought that and, and something that I pursue a lot is that you can imagine, let's say the example I use is myself, obviously, uh, because that's it's kind of straightforward. Like I am fairly good at spreadsheets, you know, but I could probably not. Like <laughs> I don't know, I couldn't be an accountant or anything. I'm pretty pretty good at accounting. I cannot you know get a job with that. I'm I'm decent at graphical design, building websites, photography, Photoshop. I know like enough things to kind of get by and like daily tasks. I would need to outsource uh, many of like the difficult stuff. I'm kind of good at like event management, you know, like customer service, you know, all of these things. I'm kind of good at jujitsu. I'm by no means a world leader. You know, he put me in the in the black belt division in a major competition and I will get my ass whooped. But I, I'm an expert still, you know, I'm an expert at teaching jujitsu. I'm an expert at making events, social events or stuff like that. But each of these skills, you can also say I'm an expert travel agent, but if I walk into a travel agency, they would probably laugh me out because I cannot, I have no kind of skills enough to get a job like that. But the combination of all these things together randomly makes me, I would say with a bit of confidence, the, the best jujitsu camp organizer in the world. I think nobody even gets close. And uh, that's, a, that's an interesting thought. Suddenly I can be the world leader at something completely random. There's no competition because almost nobody has all these combinations of skills. And that is that is super interesting. And once you're the world leader, then things are easy and, and creating things are easy. I'm not talking about business and making money. I'm talking about just like making things happen is easy if you're the best in the world at one, one thing. And that's the skills. And I, I just try to become an expert in many, many things that I just randomly stumble over and, and just completely, oh, and that it could be interesting to do calligraphy, you know, and then I'll just kind of start doing that for a few years. And suddenly I have nice handwriting and I will combine that with something else randomly one day and I will be the, the <laughs> I don't even know what it would be. I'll be the best jujitsu guy to write pretty jujitsu name tags. I don't know, something like <laughs> Cal calligraphy belt checker certificates. Like they're actually like handwritten. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody else does that. A good example is also the, the DJ thing because I just randomly had to learn that at one point. I completely suck at it, but I can kind of, I know what the buttons do. I can kind of mix tracks. Like any professional DJ would, would just laugh at that, what I could do. But that that alone, that skill would get me nowhere. But suddenly I was like, okay, I'll, I guess I'll try to play at the camp open mats. And, you know, I'm probably the best open mat DJ in the world because I'm the only one, you know? <laughs> but that's a good example of, of they're just strange combinations of skills that will get you ahead of the field. And uh, that's where I would say uh, kind of the magic happens in a sense. And yeah, that's the skills part of it. So that's a really interesting, I mean, I could unpack this all day, this particular topic. Like this is the discussion about being a generalist versus being a specialist. There, there's actually a recent really interesting book that, I mean, I, I'm assuming it's really interesting. Everyone speaks highly of it. I haven't read it yet called Range that is specifically about this concept of being a generalist. Uh, you brought up a good point that there are different levels of being an expert, right? There is I'm an expert, meaning I know enough about this that it would be worth it for you to come to me to learn about it, right? But that doesn't mean I'm like the best in the world. It could mean I'm like better than nine out of 10 people. It could mean I'm better than 99 out of 100 people. But the difference between someone in like the 99th percentile versus someone in the 99.99999th percentile is like, it's a totally different league, right? I mean, jujitsu is the obvious example, right? If you put me into a random match against people off the street, like I'm going to wreck shop on almost any of them. But you put me in there with other black belts, completely different story. You put me in there with like the elite world champions, it, I have zero chance. It's like we're doing completely different martial arts at that level, right? So there's levels at, at which you can succeed. And getting to that top level, like being the number one person 
in the world at an existing field is borderline impossible because it's not just at that point, it's not just about your talent or your hard work. That's obviously a huge part of it, but there are so many variables that could take that out of your hands, right? If, you know, Gordon Ryan, I think most people would agree is probably the greatest no-gi grappler alive. If Gordon Ryan, back in time, if at Blue Belt, he suffers a devastating injury and can't train anymore, something completely out of his hands, right? He's no longer the number one guy in the world. There's so many variables, including just chance, that go into being the best in the world. Some people can do it, and I mean, follow your passion, but it's not guaranteed. But what you're talking about here, the combination of skills allows you to create a new industry or a new niche where you can definitely be the best in the world, right? I mean, that's very much been our experience on the podcast. And actually, you can combine lessons from those different fields sometimes in interesting ways, which is called transfer of learning, right? Where you take ideas from one discipline and you cross-pollinate them into another. And that's how real creativity often happens, right? It's not just about deciding, like, I want to be the best X in the world where there's already like, it's already a super saturated market and tons of people do that rather than trying to be like the number one person in that field. If you can be the number 100 person in a bunch of different fields, it enables you to create a new field where you're definitely number one. So that's a a very important strategy. If you want to try like moving the needle and doing something that's never been done before, you're much more likely to have success if you can cross pollinate ideas in that manner. Yep. I guess we said the exact same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, with that said, we talked about failure, brains, skills. What's item number four? Yes. I mean, they could, they could be taken in random order, obviously. Oh, this could be long. Okay, it's fine. I have nothing to do. <laughs> so ideas. We could talk about generating ideas. Are ideas, is ideas the fourth item? Is that not just the byproduct of all of the other things combined? It, they're all interconnected, matrix style, like neural network. So they all kind of overlap each other. You get ideas from brains and skills, but you also get skills from ideas and brains from karma. <laughs> so they all kind of connect in a weird way. So, Well, we talked about failure. What ideas, like what's the relationship between ideas and failure? I guess they're kind of two sides of the same coin. Yeah. Ideas is, is something, it's like kind of the, the raw material that I need. You know, I need, I need things to, I need to kind of populate that list of, of ideas. You know, it's, it's kind of, it's all really really interconnected in like, I wish I had some cool illustration of it, you know, like some cool like neural network animation of all these things flying around, but I should outsource that. Like my animation skills are, I'm only an expert (laughs) at animation. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so raw material, you need, I would say like a constant input of ideas. And common misconception is that being good at generating ideas is, is something that you're kind of just, it's like a talent that you're born with or something. And the other theory is that it's something you can train, that you can practice, yeah? And I would just, I always refer people to this guy, James Altucher, who's written a lot of books. And one of them was really interesting. What was it actually called? He's written this a million times. There is Choose Yourself. I really like that book. What's it called? Choose Yourself, James Altucher. Oh, he's also on TED Talk and everything. Oh, he's an interesting guy. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Choose Yourself. So this guy went from... Homeless to millionaire to homeless to millionaire to homeless to millionaire, something like that. <laughs> I don't know if a good thing is if it's a good thing or not, but <laughs> but he's quite quite interesting and like super productive, like absolutely insanely productive. Also has a podcast. Anyway, that book is really interesting. Choose yourself. And there was a part of that book that I know he has spun off into him writing other books and a lot of blog posts about it, about how to become an idea machine. I am very sure that he also wrote a book called that because I think everything he talks about is that he will write books about it. How to become an, an idea machine. Just Google that and then there will probably be a blog post or something about it. But it's kind of an interesting approach that I did not believe in. And then I tried it and I was like, hot oh, damn, this fucking works so well. And it's literally just kind of imagining that there is a physical muscle that generates ideas somewhere in your brain and that you can train that, you know, like any other muscle in in your body. And you do that by repetition and recovery. Do repetitions until it's fatigued and then let it recover. And that's literally it. And, And it's just, it's very simple. You just kind of, the idea is write down 10 ideas every day. That is kind of difficult and it hurts, like physically hurts in your brain. And that is the point of it. And it's no different than doing 10 repetitions for your bicep every day. It's a very interesting approach that I really enjoyed doing. 
and it helped me tremendously. Like it, I, I have, uh, if this was my bicep, it would be so damn swole right now, you know? <laughs> uh, I would have the most amazing bicep in the world, but I have a muscle somewhere inside of my brain that is quite impressive because I practice it uh, all the time. And this is a fabulous technique that I highly recommend. I just look up one of his books or blog posts or something. I remember he said he got it from some other book where he did not believe in it. Then he tried it out. But I, I never <laughs> found the original. I, I never really looked for it. But anyway, it's really, really simple. So it's literally just write down 10 ideas every day. That's literally it. And it is hard, damn hard. And it just hurts. Like it physically hurts in your brain. But that's the point. It's like working that muscle to fatigue. And then there's a few, like, I would say, like, rules or something or, like, things you should follow. But it, it's pretty straightforward. And, uh, yeah, that, that's been interesting. And with having a, a swole idea muscle just generates, uh, like, a ton of ideas. Just, like, it's just have, being, having good idea fitness, you know. It just, it just works. After I've been doing this, I just, like, someone throws me one word. Or someone, I, have, I have a conversation with one person and it's just like, just like I write down ideas like left and right. That's interesting. And that, that, that also goes together with, I mean, as I say, they all overlap. And, and when, I, when I acquire a new skill, immediately that skill gives me ideas, you know? And when I talk with people, conversations give me ideas or I read books or, but I need to have that, that strong idea muscle where I'm, I'm really good at it. You know? I've always been good at generating ideas for whatever reason. So you can say in a sense, I was born with it, but having done this actual training, you know, it's like, it's like maybe I'm a natural grappler. You know, those guys who come in, never did any grappling, but they're just like, they can just wrestle, you know, for whatever reason, they can just wrestle. That's me, you know, when just with ideas, but then you teach them actual jujitsu and then it's another level. So. Yeah. I love that idea of ideation being a muscle you can work just like anything else. That's a really, really fantastic mm -hmm. way of describing it. I might have to go write down some ideas now. Yeah. And you, you say, see, now just having that conversation, just connecting brains, then usually that makes it very easy to, to, to stimulate that muscle in a sense. Got it. Well, I guess the last thing to talk about then is karma. I'd love to hear your philosophy here on what you mean by that. Okay. I'm thinking of how to do this shortly. <laughs> <laughs> I once did this, this round the world jujitsu trip where I traveled for six months and I visited 56 academies. So it was kind of high intensity. And all I did was like, I posted online, say, uh, I was like a brown belt at the time and I'd been teaching forever I've, at my entire career, like 11 years or something. And I just posted, uh, anyone anywhere in the world, I will teach uh, for free. If you can give me a place to sleep, then I'll just come and teach jujitsu for free for a few days. And uh, I got hundreds of invitations. It was quite overwhelming. And it turned into, to say life-changing uh, a trip would be an understatement. And I, I went, you know, just around the world and I went to so many strange places. And I was just blown away with happy people were that I gave them jujitsu, you know, because I have been teaching forever. And it's just something I do, you know, I just show up and I teach jujitsu. And people like it. Sometimes they they used to pay for it. I don't charge for it anymore, but it used to be my job. And, and I was just blown away with how much value I could give people just by giving them jujitsu, just by giving them something that was kind of, I wouldn't say worthless for me, but it was, it's such easy work for me that it's not something that I consider like, oh, this is amazing. This I have to give. It's just teaching jujitsu, you know? And, and people around the world, I just walked into one remote small gym after the other in the strangest corners of the world and and they were just so happy that I gave them something that they that was not kind of expected you know that created the entire trip for me you know people were so excited to invite me to their homes to show me around where they they lived and it was like that every every single place I went and I was like damn this is this is quite amazing this entire trip was I I could have done the, done it the other way around I could have said I will teach jujitsu anywhere. It's going to be 500 euros for a small seminar. And uh, I will figure out my own like sightseeing and hotel and pay for everything myself. Yeah. I could have done that, but that was, that would be the other extreme of it. But here, like everyone was so excited to go out to eat with me and like, you know, cook me dinner or whatever, or like take me out to see where they lived. And, and I realized, wow, I had no idea that it was so valuable that I just give something to people like that when they don't expect it. And when I when I came back home, 
after that trip, I was kind of, I was high on life to say it mildly. And I was like, damn, that kind of just giving something away literally defined my life, like literally changed everything for me. If I had not done that trip, I would have been a completely different place in in every sense. And I was like, oh, I should do this more. You know, I should, I should try to what else can I give away? You know, what else, what else can I do that would make people so happy for something that's just a small thing? And uh, I turned that into an experiment and that experiment has been running for 10 years now ongoing to every single opportunity I have, I will plant a seed of karma, you know, uh, just a little thing. And sometimes, many times nothing happens from it. And sometimes it grows into an enormous tree that changes my life in a sense. But I just kind of spam the world with karma. Every time I see an opportunity for to help someone with something, I will do it immediately. I will like jump on it right away. And that has changed everything for me, I would say. like I can look back at every single project I've done or pulled off that turned into something good, and I can point out exactly, I can kind of build the flowchart back in time from all the, the skills and ideas and everything that combined and all the failures and how it ended up with this one project that, that you only see, you don't see the backlog and you see that this worked e- extremely well. And I can point out exactly where in this this kind of process where I infused some karma, so to say, in, in my life, I planted karma seeds. And if I had not done that, then I would not have ended up with 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 what I ended up with that worked. So I think about this a lot and and I I have done this a lot, you know, when I came back from that trip, I was just like like constantly searching for what can I do? Like if some if friends are moving to another apartment, I will be the first one to be there to help out, you know. Just anything I can do without expecting anything back. It's not like a something for something. It's not like I will do something for you so you better help me with my business when I need to, you know. I will buy from your business, so you better buy from... It's like a mafia yeah, yeah. boss. <laughs> we support each other. I buy from your business, you better buy from my business. You know, it's not like that. I, I think it's about creating a high calm environment. You know, if, if I create an environment for myself that is high in karma, where people legitimately are interested in helping each other, then things are just so much easier, you know, in terms, especially when you want to get something off the ground, you know, or you want to pull off some some crazy idea. It's always nice to be surrounded by people who really want to help each other, you know, who think, who can see the value in that. There are some, again, more details to this that I can say if you have, if if you have another two hours, you can watch the workshop on YouTube. (laughs) But I I think our audience loves long form content. Send them like a 10 hour video and I guarantee you they will listen to it front to back. Yeah, we can do 10 hours, no problem. (laughs) I think that one of the keys that I found definitely is is unexpected is always always kind of makes the value exponentially higher. You know, I made this a uh, very scientific illustration in my workshop of the perceived value of a kitchen machine gift. If you give someone a kitchen machine on their birthday or Christmas, they will be like, "Great, the kitchen machine, thank you so much." But honestly, if you show up like on a on a Tuesday and give your neighbor a kitchen machine, they will probably remember that for the rest of their lives, you know, because it's unexpected. That, that I never give I never give presents on on birthdays or Christmas because I don't I don't believe that that stuff or any other holidays, because when you expect it, then it's always a something for something. Because then it's also expected the other way when it is your birthday. It's kind of a weird thing, I'd, but that's another talk. But anyway, unexpected just makes it so much more valuable. If if I kind of pass by a city or something randomly, and I know someone there, I will say, "Hey, uh, if you want to, like, I'll come in and cover your class tonight, like uh, free of charge." And they didn't even know I was coming, and they will be super happy. You know, for me, it's just another night of teaching jujitsu or rolling with people. And I say, "You could take take the night off if you want. I, I can cover, do your, I can literally like offer to do your job tonight if you want." And it brings value to everyone. And there are millions of examples of this. And I think like doing it unexpected is is the key. But I just always look for ways to surprise people with something nice, you know. And if I can do that, then I don't know if it's, if I'm ever going to get anything back from it. But sometimes I do, and sometimes it changes everything for me. And it's also nice, you know. People are happy, and uh, you create an environment of people are really happy to to help each other when it's needed, you know. So I look for it's just just like I lo- I look for those opportunities of uh, of people being annoyed about things, you know. Like and often, if they're annoyed about it, say, "Hey, is there anything I could do here with my skills or my time or or my initiative that could help this person 
or unexpectedly. And then that, that is very, very valuable for, for, I would say, being a super creator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I remember when I was in my twenties, I, you know, I would read these, these books and hear these talks from these, you know, these elders who would say, oh, it's all about giving, you know, giving, giving is important because it helps you grow. And, you know, being a selfish 20 year old, I remember thinking, oh, whatever, grandpa, that's all BS, you know, and I, I was very self-focused during that time of my life. I was very focused on building my career, my skill set getting my job security and I didn't really take the time to build relationships with anyone else or to or to really go out of my way to give or to help people and I I have to say now that I'm getting close to my 40s like fuck they were totally right mm -hmm. <laughs> like giving is trust and trust is the true currency if you are generous not just with your money but with your time if you legitimately take an interest in helping other people not only will that make you feel good not only will it help other people but it will actually help you in totally unforeseen ways and in ways that are way more valuable than like a pay raise or something like that so highly recommend that don't make the mistake i did like focus on giving back early on right don't wait until you think you're don't say oh i'll wait until i have enough money and then i'll start giving that's not the right approach it is better to be generous now than to try to put it off until you have some theoretical security later in life well and it doesn't have to be money at all money is like the the cheapest way of giving you know that's the easiest way just buy some someone a gift you know it, it sucks don't do that if you have skills you can give with your skills very easy you know you can teach something or any if you're good at one thing and someone you can fix something for someone just like that's a great thing, especially if they didn't expect it. It could also be connections. Like say, let's say one person would like to do something and you know another person who are interested in this or are good at this, then you can introduce them to each other. That would be very easy to, very easy little karma seed to plant right there. And they would both be happy. Or it could just be your time. You're just, if someone needs help with something, you uh, yeah, sure, I'll come and paint your house or whatever. <laughs> like it, it could be a nice little, we could have a, a nice conversation that day. But I think... I think the key is it's I think it's healthy no matter what to ask yourself when is the last time you did something nice and unexpected for someone else. When is the last time you gave someone a present that was not on their birthday or Christmas or whatever whenever you give presents. I think that's that's a healthy question to ask yourself. Usually it's like man, it's usually a long time ago. And the more unexpected the better, you know. Hey, try to go to the supermarket and you know the cashier try to say something nice to them about their their work. I guarantee you they did not expect that. That is the easiest way to to totally change someone's day, maybe their life, yep. is just to unexpectedly give a genuine compliment or statement of thanks to someone. Mm -hmm. Like I I remember people like I, I remember a cab driver I had like 25 years ago who said something nice to me and it stuck with me to this day, right? Like that kind of stuff goes a lot further than money. Yep. And yeah, so it's not about spending money, it's not about waiting till you have enough money to do something nice or that you can donate or something, right? Forget about the money. Just next time you're in the supermarket, if someone does a nice job, it's like, if you know what? The person who puts the fruit up really nice, you know, if you randomly run into them, let them know. Like literally, they, I promise you, they will, that will be the best, best day of their month. Probably, you know, they're probably used to people being like, get the fuck out of the way so I can touch all the avocados, you know? Like, yeah. so... <laughs> uh, that, that's th these these things are interesting, but you have to look for them all the time. Uh, easy, sorry, they're easy, but you have to look for them all the time. And and I can I can I can kind of trace back so many, I would say, success stories that I have that were came out of in one way or the other of 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 this. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Amazing. So that's absolutely crucial, and I try to do that like every single day. I try to look for opportunities for for this. Yeah? So to recap here, the Christian Graugart five-part super creator formula, failure brain, skills, ideas, karma. Am I mm -hmm. right? Got it. Perfect. I'll put that in the show notes. Yep. Amazing stuff. Well, thank you so much, Christian. This See, we got through everything. It wasn't too bad. It wasn't too long. It was it's shorter than your talk. Yeah, just like five minutes shorter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, it's fine. I enjoy well, it. Hey, I enjoy it. So everyone out there probably knows about BJJ Globetrotters. Everyone out there probably knows about beltchecker.com, but I'd love to hear a plug for your new Teaching BJJ initiative. I know that this is, I mean, this episode probably won't go live for a few weeks, so it might be old news by then, but as of this recording, it's a relatively new thing. Tell me about this thing. I mean, I've, I've started seeing the posts. I'd love to learn more about teachingbjj.com. 
Yeah, I mean, it's just another wild combination of ideas and skills and stuff over time. Again, just a combination of these five things. And it randomly gave birth to this idea because I, I'm thinking often thinking a lot about how can I create, I always try to create win-win situations for everyone involved in whatever I do. If I cannot, if I cannot ha have everyone walk out of there with a smile, then I'm not doing it. Like every single person involved. Uh, that's probably the karma aspect of it. You know, I, I don't ever want to, I never do any hard negotiations. The same for in, in business, you know, I would, I always negotiate literally on the, the opposite part from the other side. I negotiate against myself in a sense. If I can create something where everybody's happy, then that is, and I can kind of stand in the middle, then that's usually interesting. Like a good example if, is jujitsu competitions. You know, you provide mats, a referee, uh, a scoreboard, and then two people will pay combined $240 to roll for five minutes. Right? That's a pretty interesting business. You know, you just kind of, everybody's happy. They get something out of it. You know? But okay, let's say someone likes to play music for money. Other people likes to listen to music. You kind of find a place for that and then everybody's happy. You know? And it's kind of the same thing. I, I, I feel like people were complaining that nobody knows how to properly teach jujitsu. Like there is no real skills in this. We don't learn this. We just roll and then eventually, oh, I guess we're teaching, you know? So that that was kind of a complaint that I caught up on on the on the on the bus and the the, uh, the the frequencies, you know. It's like geez, geez, there's something there people are complaining about. Like people are complaining about it. nobody actually. It's annoying. Like you know, you have someone who actually professional. Like at they actually know how to teach, but they're white belts, so they have to keep their mouth shut. You know, they cannot. <laughs> they just sit there in the back of the room. <laughs> they can't talk. This is fucking ridiculous. This guy has no idea how to pass on information efficiently. He's just showing a few moves, and then we're rolling. But I cannot say anything because I'm at the bottom of the hierarchy, you know. And that's something that like people are like, uh, this uh, th th someone should do something, you know. It's one of those things. And I thought, hey, you know, some people are actually really good at teaching. You know, they actually know their stuff. Like they really know how to do this. Like there is a real science and some real skill behind this. And there's a lot of experience, you know, that people have acquired from from decades of of uh, of being instructors. And uh, I said, there's nowhere to go and find this if you if you want to improve as an instructor. And usually it's like, it can also be a little bit embarrassing to be like a black belt instructor and then admit that you actually have no idea what you're doing. You know, you just kind of do what you've always done or like show people what you do. Uh, you just kind of demo what you can do pretty much. And then hopefully they, they're talented enough to figure it out themselves. It can be a little bit embarrassing when people tell you, you actually don't know how to teach. Yeah. That can be a that can be very uh what do you say? What's the word? It's you know, the way that I would describe it, well, it's an attack on the ego, right? Ultimately the problem. That's it. That's it. That was what I was looking at. Yeah. Yeah. The trick with having a black belt is it's a it's supposed to be a powerful symbol, right? And people mistakenly think, as you mentioned earlier, and as I've heard many people say, that people think that when they have a black belt, that means they're supposed to be a black belt in everything. And they feel like they, they just can't admit limitations to their knowledge, mm -hmm. which I, I mean, I've been guilty of that, right? You know, you are in a class, you're teaching, you're standing up in front of the class, you've got a black belt, everyone else has white belts. There's a group of 30 people listening to you. Someone asks you a question. There's a lot of pressure to feel like you have the answer. Yep. And, you know, a lot of the times that leads to people making stuff up. And after time, when people live in this environment long enough, then eventually they start drinking their own Kool-Aid and thinking, well, maybe I am the grandmaster. And that's when you wind up with, you know, I like, I, I love it when like black belts are giving you like investment advice and stuff. It's like, motherfucker, you're a black belt in jujitsu. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't need to hear your investment advice. There's probably investment advisors in the room right now if I care about that. Right. But that's a great point. And I think that's why teaching BJJ is such a great idea because so much of the jujitsu teaching method is it's basically regurgitation, right? People just take what their instructor taught them and they just regurgitate it to their students, maybe with a few variations. But I love that guys like you and Preet and your team are actively trying to add teaching methodologies into the sport. Yeah. I mean, and this was, again, it, it was a wild combination of many things, but also Preet started talking a little bit about this. And Preet is very good at being just very straightforward. He just tells you right to your face, Christian, you have no idea what the fuck you're doing. And I'm like, God damn, I've been doing this for 20 years. Oh, fuck, you're right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> take some time to kind of digest that. 
And uh, and then uh, one of the things that he was uh, often like ranting about at the camps were like, but people have no idea how to teach jujitsu. They just do random shit. They don't know how to teach. And uh, I suggested to him like, you should do a workshop at the camp saying, do you want to get better at jujitsu? Like how? And we filmed that, and that was one of the most viewed videos on the Club Tradition Action YouTube channel. I, I believe it's just called "Do you want Do you want to get better at jujitsu or something?" It's just him talking for an hour. And he's like, "I don't know what to say," but it's like literally, pretty, we know how this works. You literally just start talking, and then you don't stop for like an hour, two hours. That's how it works. <laughs> we just press record, and then you don't stop talking. That's exactly how it works. And that that, that was just and this. This video was kind of went a little bit viral, you know, because like, God damn, someone's actually talking about teaching methodology, like in jujitsu and, and kind of calling out this, this shitty stuff. And nobody else is talking, people just spamming jujitsu community with uh, techniques, you know, just, just a DVD, watch this DVD, more DVDs. Uh, now 80% off, more DVDs, more techniques, you know, just, you got to watch this because this guy is the best in the world. And it's just like, it's just useless in a sense. Like, I wouldn't say it's useless, but it's like, it's, it's, I think it's the wrong approach. And then Prit came along and suddenly it's like, and it's not like he's not an expert in this. He's not a professional teacher. Other people are, but he will listen to them. And then he talked about that for now. That video went online and people were like, oh, what a relief that someone is finally talking about this because it's like, I'm a professional teacher, but my instructor has no idea what he's doing, but I can't, you know, get myself to, to try to tell him that he doesn't know what he's doing. And I was like, this video is so interesting and, and there's more of this. And you're like, God damn, some people actually know a lot about this stuff, you know? And that's when I thought, okay, there's obviously like a frustration that people don't know how to teach. Like most, most jujitsu instructors do not know how to teach, like myself included, uh, did not at least. That is just a fact. That is just straight up fact. You, if you sign up, if you pay whatever uh, dollars or whatever your currency is for jujitsu instructions, the likelihood that your instructor is a complete amateur at what he's doing, except for the actual jujitsu part, is very, very extremely high. You know? And he probably just guesses, you know, at what he's doing. And then you know, you put yourself at a pedestal, and then you you kind of, as you say, like you you create an uh, kind of an illusion of that you know what you're doing, but you probably don't. And the same for me. I I that was me, you know. And and then I said, like, hey, hey, there's actually some people who know this stuff, you know, who actually know a lot about this. What can we do? How can I be in the middle? I can randomly combine some skills. Like I know a little bit about a, a lot of things. And the random combination of all these skills makes it very, very easy for me to set up like a digital subscription platform where I can involve some instructors who know a lot about this to make content. And then someone else who wants this content to kind of find them, you know, they can kind of find each other. And then we make a calculation and depending on how many minutes of views every instructor get, they get a cut of the, of the profit. If there is any profit, if not, then it's just instructors helping each other out, which is also a win-win situation. So it's kind of just, I was just thinking, can I create something where everybody is happy? You know? So people, some people come in, they are happy because they become better jujitsu instructors. They learn something that's kind of taboo to, to, to say that, Hey, I actually don't know anything about this. I'm a, I'm a professional instructor. I don't know what to do. Can you help me out? No, that's that's a bit of taboo. And then also some people who know about this who who cannot, in a sense, kind of pass it on because they're not in a position to do that. And me in the middle, who just kind of makes these people meet. You know, it's it's no different than hiring a band and uh, finding an audience and then put them in the same room. You know? Yeah. And hey, shout out to Adam Medlock who actually has content up on TeachingBJJ.com. He's actually a member of the of our community and he was the guest on the prior episode that we just did oh, yeah, so right. he's a he's an awesome teacher especially if you're interested in special needs um that's his area of expertise so highly recommend if you check out teaching bjj and check out adam especially if that's something that's of interest to you mm -hmm. so thanks christian thanks for everything you do man oh yeah of course just to let people know how it works is that instructors can contribute if they contribute they get access to all the the stuff the profit is shared between all the instructors, depending on like how many views they get and also how many referrals they get. So it's a it's like a one time payment, and and the majority of the money goes to to be shared between all the instructors who are contributing. So that's how it works. If if anyone is is interested, or if I mean if you don't feel like paying, I, right now I think the price was two hundred fifty dollars for a lifetime access. Then you can also contribute with some stuff, and then it's free. So everybody's happy. So if you want to be a super creator, then the first place to go is teachingbjj.com and you can create content, benefit the community, establish your reputation, 
everything that we talked about today. Hey, now you sound like a sales, sound like a salesman. Oh, no, that's not my stuff. <laughs> It's sort of my thing. <laughs> anyway, actually, on that note, on that note, as we're talking about karma and giving, mm-hmm. you know, it takes a lot of time and effort to put this show together. So to all of the listeners, thanks again for those who do support us on Patreon. The address is patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. Of course, this thing is free, but we really do appreciate the support to help keep the lights on. Again, patreon.com slash BJJ Mental Models. If you want to give us some help, would be greatly appreciated. Christian, I know it's getting late on your side. I do appreciate the time, man. I thought this was a fantastic chat. I really love the idea of this framework. So I'll I'll make sure to pass along the link to that video in the show notes, just so everyone can check it out. Because I'm sure two hours is not enough for most people. They're going to want to go and have like- They need another two hours. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) This is just volume one. Volume two is the YouTube video. You're literally only halfway through right now. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, take an intermission and then it's like it's like a, the Super Bowl, you know, take an intermission, come back and then you can watch the second half. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, uh, thanks for having me. I'm sorry it took I'm sorry it took 8 months to set this up, but uh no, we actually made it happen. So It was worth it. <laughs> yeah. No, the pleasure was all mine. <laughs> Beautiful. Well, thank you again, Christian, and of course, thanks to everyone who takes the time to listen to this and and write in and contribute. Really do appreciate it and talk to all of you guys next week. Bye.